All right, team, look alive. Mr. Snipes is on his way out of the chapel now with the HBI. Let's make sure he's covered. Get down! We have a shooter on the roof. I repeat, we have a shooter on the roof. Get clear, Wesley, I'll cover you. You can't make Blade 4 if you're dead. Damn it, I don't have time for this. Because this is movie night. Hello and welcome to the 150th episode of Movie Night. I'm your host, Jonathan Pollard. Action Movie Month continues tonight with a look at three classic action films from Wesley Snipes, beginning with his first, Passenger 57. Produced on a budget of 15 million, this Kevin Hooks movie tripled its budget and helped propel Wesley Snipes' career. When international terrorist Bruce Payne seizes control of a passenger jet, an airline security expert already on board must take action in the 84-minute story. Although he had been featured in high-profile roles before, most notably in White Men Can't Jump, this adventure from November of 1992 really made Snipes into a bona fide action hero. It's easy to see why. He's resourceful, charming, and makes knocking out bad guys look easy. Offering a roulette strategy with a fantastic one-liner, Snipes taunts his adversary by advising, always bet on black. I won't go so far as to say Wesley is a great actor, but with the right parts, he can really excel, and it seems as if the titular role here was tailor-made for his talents. Payne, meanwhile, is the real highlight of the cast, portraying a perfectly deranged and ambitious villain, who refers to his fellow hijackers as his colleagues and staff. His menacing stare and unwavering voice make him particularly menacing, and easily the best part of Passenger 57. It's unfortunate, though, that this is honestly the only picture of his I'm familiar with. There's some acceptable supporting work from Tom Sizemore, Bruce Greenwood, and Alex Thatcher as well. And last but not least, playing a traitorous flight attendant is 27-year-old Elizabeth Hurley, who is far too beautiful to be on the receiving end of a punch to the face. The R-rated story opens with a ridiculous sequence that has Payne exhibiting omnipresent knowledge. First, he knows exactly when pursuing FBI members are about to arrest him, and then he knows precisely where to land when jumping out of a fifth-story window. It's decently exciting to watch, but the unbelievability of it took me out of the film. It also doesn't make any sense. If he knew the police were coming, why did he put himself in a vulnerable position to begin with? Oh, shit. Cut, are you there? Cut it! You! Back to your seat, now! Oh, please, I don't want to die! Please don't shoot me! I don't want to die! I said! No, 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 while other moments do work, like when Snipes escapes police custody or when Payne's group quickly takes over the airplane, it's a huge second act detour that completely ruins the pacing of this film. In what fails to make any sense no matter how many times you watch, the plane lands, there's an extended cat and mouse chase at a conveniently nearby fair, and then everyone gets back on the plane for the final 10 minutes of the movie. Meanwhile, the music from Stanley Clark fits the early 90s time period perfectly, but it's also rather annoying at times, a loud and obnoxious blend of saxophones and hip-hop. Indeed, the quick beats of bongo drums during a surprise knife fight feel particularly dated. After the predictable climax, flight control begins laughing and the other passengers actually start doing the Arsidio Hall chant. This aviation thriller is largely disposable and unbelievable, but Passenger 57 does overcome its formulaic story with interesting characters and a fun tone. I thought it was an alright movie. Next up tonight, Murder at 1600. Based on the novel Murder in the White House by President Harry S. Truman's daughter, Margaret Truman, this crime drama from director Dwight Little was a modest success, earning $26 million at the box office. The downright absurd premise follows Washington, D.C. homicide detective Wesley Snipes, who is curiously summoned to the executive mansion to investigate the titular crime. If the Secret Service was actually absent-minded enough to allow such a violent act to occur, the poor victim has her throat slashed open in a bathroom stall, are we really meant to believe they would request outside help from a civilian cop? The 107-minute story is undeniably in intriguing, though, especially once that pesky jurisdiction nonsense is addressed. The twisty and turning narrative throws its audience off the set with a number of convincing red herrings. I mean, you have Alan Alda and Ronnie Cox as smarmy old white politicians. Either one could be involved in a cover-up. 
Snipes is his usual fast-talking and sarcastic badass, not afraid to butt heads against authority to get what he wants. When he suggests that the POTUS himself may be a suspect, Alda is quick to remind him that the presidential institution is one that will be protected at all costs. Diane Lane functions great as the headstrong and beautiful Secret Service agent opposite, while Dennis Miller is effective as Snipes' partner, even if he's just playing Dennis Miller. The unique character details are liberally sprinkled on here like salt on popcorn. Wesley isn't just a cop, he also builds miniatures. And Diane isn't just Secret Service, she's also an Olympic gold medalist for sharpshooting. Daniel Benzali is the final supporting player of note, who provides a great turn as a gruff and pragmatic agent tasked with protecting the president. Released in April of 1997, the R-rated film takes place during a weird period in American history, when a character can mention email in one scene, and then turn around and use a phone booth in the next. But a sequence late in the picture, when our heroes sneak into the White House through a hidden underground tunnel, is quite suspenseful. Although it rather adeptly combines elements of political thrillers with crime procedurals, Murder at 1600 still falls victims to the familiar tropes of both. The music from Christopher Young is at its best during the faster action scenes, which although few in number, are paced throughout the story at a good interval. Reviewing awful movies is always fun, and talking about excellent ones is easy, but discussing mediocre movies is much harder. It's tough to fault this picture, as it doesn't make any huge mistakes, but it doesn't really live up to its unique premise, either. Fans of Snipes or 90s action films will enjoy this one at least once, though. Otherwise, Murder at 1600 is an unimpressive procedural presented with some interesting twists. I thought it was good. Finally tonight, let's review U.S. Marshals. A sequel to the film adaptation of The Fugitive, this Stuart Bard action thriller was released on March 6, 1998, eventually grossing over 100 million in ticket sales against its $60 million budget. Its predecessor was a monumental accomplishment, both critically and commercially, so while I understand a desire for a follow-up, it's completely unnecessary. Rather than focusing on the escapee like the 1993 original, this 131 minute plot follows the titular lawmen as they track down a dangerous fugitive. Leading the task force is Tommy Lee Jones, who returns as the relentless deputy with a heart of gold. His merry band of colleagues give him someone to bounce exposition off of, but they're mostly reduced to a bunch of whiny complainers. In fact, there's an entire scene where Joe Pantoliano bitches about lost luggage for some reason. I suppose these moments are meant to humanize the background players or give them some personalities, but it's just so irrelevant and off-tone, it doesn't work. Supporting a mushroom haircut that's not doing him any favors, Robert Downey Jr. joins the group as a stubborn and reluctant accomplice who remains focused on his own motives. On the run from the government who framed him and the officials tasked with tracking him down, Wesley Snipes plays an ex-special operative embroiled in an international conspiracy. But he's woefully underdeveloped until the midway point. Up until then, we don't know if he's guilty or innocent. Finally elaborating on his predicament, Snipes complains, I got set up from the word go. For a 90s action flick, the performances from all those involved are honestly better than what is expected, and the overly complicated script benefits as a result. It's over. Let's go home. Nah. You go home. What really makes this otherwise familiar affair memorable is two standout action sequences. The first, an even bigger and more explosive escape scenario, a la the train collision in the first film. Except this time it's a jetliner that slides over an embankment into a river after an emergency landing goes wrong. The resulting aerial shot that shows off the entire crash site the day after is incredibly impressive. The other notable sequence is a big stunt that took over two months to plan culminating with Snipes' stunt double jumping off of an eight-story building and swinging to a nearby train platform. These days, such a daring escape would be done digitally or with the aid of chroma key, but the people behind U.S. Marshals did it for real, and it looks fantastic. 
Longtime film editor turned director Barr does a good job with a PG-13 rated film, utilizing interesting locations like a Tennessee swamp or an expansive cemetery outside of Chicago. Jerry Goldsmith's loud, trumpet-filled score isn't anything special, but as with most of his work, it still creates true suspense. The pacing doesn't feel organic though, as the plot comes full stop on several occasions before a completely new lead is introduced and the characters all travel to a new venue. For all its predictable flaws, the film does find a way to surprise and excite on multiple viewings. U.S. Marshals is a fun and above average chase film, even if nobody asked for it. And here are some of your reviews. Praising the action and calling it underrated, you scored this a 7. And I agree. While it may not be as unique or as powerful as The Fugitive, it is a decent follow-up. I thought it was cool as well. Finally tonight, some tweet critiques to show us what you're saying about films currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. Action Movie Month continues later this week with three Bruce Willis reviews. Striking Distance, The Fifth Element, and Red 2. Please participate in this wonderful interactive show by leaving your reviews for these three films in the comments below or by voting in the polls. If you'd like to watch more Movie Night reviews, check out the related videos on the right or click subscribe to be notified of all new content. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.